Hey, how are you, Tessa? There's one thing like a lot of people achieved things over 2020, but you've achieved something really personal to you, which is a new home in New mm. York, which actually is you know gracing the cover of the April issue of Tatler Homes, which is why we're speaking to you today. And it's an exclusive story to Tatler Homes in Asia. So for those of you tuning in, I'm sure you know Lee. And you've, if you don't know Lee's face, you've definitely seen his designs. His collections are available over 50 countries all over the world. And he counts people like Beyonce as his fans. So we're really excited to talk to you about your home in New York. So there are many special things about this place. And however, the most dramatic thing about it, and as I, as I can understand, you love drama, you, had a, you have a theater background, is the fact that you had to design this home remotely. Could you tell us a little bit of the challenges about designing your home from afar? Sure, I mean, initially I was able to be in New York. So I was on site uh, for the first few weeks. I think I was there February, early February last year, and then we left kind of middle of March to come back to the UK when the lockdown was put in place. So I was there initially to do all the kind of first fix and the space planning and uh, the strip out. And we actually probably got, I would say about, you know, 70% of the project completed. Oh. Um, so the things like the sort of the painting, the decorating, any structural work that we wanted to, to add in. However, any interior designer knows that the most challenging parts are the end parts of the process. So the space planning, the furniture placement, the styling, the lighting, all of those elements that really turn the space into an interiors project. Um, and those were the items that I had to do remotely. You know, so when, you, when you're working on an interiors project, if anything, you could do most of the remote work at the beginning. You know, okay. it's not necessary for you to be on site all of the time, but in the final parts, that last 10% makes 50% of the difference. Um, so how did you do that? You mean the 10% of like placement of the sofa, which you designed a special sofa for your yeah. New York. Yeah. Placement of the gallery walls and stuff like that. How did you do it? remotely well i mean already i had a really clear idea of what i wanted to to do in each of the spaces i'd sourced all the items i had some of the pieces already or designed them so i we'd done plans i knew what was going into the space but until you're actually in the room and you're putting things around you, you can't completely tell um so what i decided to do was to visualize every single item that i had whether it was vintage or whether it was new or whether it was one of my own designs we did a visualization of them we did a visualization of every single room in the computer wow. and i literally styled it virtually in that way to get it to a point where i was completely happy uh, with the project from a digital perspective then I gave that to the contractor. I had uh, a great stylist on the ground in New York who was assisting me with this. And I said to them, right, this is how I want you to place everything. And even if it feels odd to put in this position or doesn't feel right, just do it. And then we'll photograph and film everything and then we'll do a walkthrough. Um, and that's, that's how we did it. And after that period of them putting everything into place, I, they were literally, I was asking for photographs from this corner, that corner, from this angle, do a video, walk through again. So everything was WhatsApp on Zoom. Oh my God. We were like, move it to the left, move it to the right, move it up, move it down. How does, and then obviously asking their opinions as well, entrusting in them and how does it look in reality, you know, I'm seeing how it looks on the screen, but how does this work in reality? So it was challenging. I mean, I mean, it must that. have been difficult, especially the photos. Of course, when I received the photos, they looked like immaculate, perfect. But how it must have taken double the time to achieve that photo shoot that you that you provided us. Well, I mean, the well, the good thing is, is that I I photographed my space my, myself in the space before I left, which was good okay. because that room was the most complete. We managed to have um, the furniture layout, the lighting, the decor was almost complete in that space. 
which was great. It was the rest of the uh, apartment, which was kind of needed another 20% to be complete. It was challenging, I think, you know, as a designer, you really have to think on your on your feet in that instance when you're not there you're so used to being part of the environment and the space and of course when you're shooting it what I did was I designed it around a photo shoot in this instance right. you know so um when we were looking at it I wasn't designing it with the practicality of I need to be able to put my cup on that table within sure. arm sure system. it's how does it look in the photograph which is what you do when you're photographing an interior right. anyway, when you're choosing a frame, you will move things into positions that wouldn't ordinarily work in a practical way, but it suits the composition of the image. Of course. So that's we did it for the photo shoot. And the other thing is, is that in this instance, you need to surround yourself with really talented people. And, and we had an amazing photographer called Stephen Kent Johnson and a great stylist, uh, Michael Reynolds, who, um, do this all the time and they really know their stuff so the apartment was in really good hands for the photo shoot I didn't have to worry too much that's great um having done that over the year if you could share like one tip apart from having really trusted people on the ground is there one tip you could give people in the same predicament I personally am in the same predicament so I'm really keen to to hear your thoughts um I think the first thing that I had to do was to not resist the situation that was happening. Because initially my mindset was, we can't do this. This is gonna be impossible to do. It's really difficult. You know, you have to be there. And eventually I was kind of taught myself into the fact that there was no other way and that this was gonna be a fun and exciting and challenging experiment. Um, so that was the first thing. And then I think the second thing is really what I picked up on before was that I was as prescriptive as possible to every single detail, even if I knew in the back of my head that we would probably be changing a lot of those details once they're in. But you need to go through that process in order to work out what is right, what works and what doesn't work, whether it's remotely or not. So having everything visualized and having them put everything in how I imagined it was really helpful because then I got a sense of being in the space. Mm. I was actually, because I was also working on New York time. So I was like, you know, for like three- You were in New York, basically. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was kind of up until like four or 5 a.m. Um, and I remember kind of going to bed and then waking up and then thinking that I'd actually been in the apartment you know oh <laughs> it was surreal I kind of immersed myself in it so much virtually for a second I felt like I'd actually been in the space wow um, I think so I should do that and think like I'm in Italy or somewhere for two <laughs> and then wake up and pretend oh my god I'm in Sicily <laughs> is that where your home is no, no, I'm originally from the Philippines, but I'm in Singapore at the moment. But Singapore is great. One thing is to, we do have summer weather all year round, so I can't complain. Okay, but you mentioned you were doing up another home remotely. Is that, where yeah. is that? In, in Japan. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, so we bought it just before COVID. So I haven't been there since, um, since the border was really closed. But um, yeah, fun, <laughs> challenging. <laughs> Um, okay, now, can you walk us through a little bit about your home in New York, um, which is very different from the typical open plant penthouse? Um, what are your favorite areas and details and why? Sure. Um, I would say that, first of all, the living space is one of my favorite areas. It, um, it has a lot of natural daylight, and that's why I chose very uh, kind of pale ivory colors. I wanted to keep the tones very light, very airy, but sort of work with um, textures more than anything. So there's a lot of ivory and then that's complemented with some brushed brass and some matte black finishes, but there's lots of different textures in there, such as this sort of beautiful beige travertine marble, mm. which we have from Italy. Yeah. But the main thing that I wanted to do with that room was to create some furniture pieces that sat specifically in that environment. So I designed the sofa and the coffee tables 
uh, the fireplace, some of the plinths. So it's very, very bespoke in that respect. But um, uh, it's it allowed me to actually kind of experiment. You know, I hadn't designed a sofa for about 10 years. Um, we're going to release the piece now. Um, oh, great. Spring. Yeah. Um, and I'm really happy with it. It's a, a modular piece and it has these very monolithic side tables and corner tables that basically connect the sofa parts together. So they're connected by the tables That's and gives the impression that the sofa is almost floating. Um, it's very monolithic and very hard, but it's also very feminine because it has these beautiful curves, these architectural lines and they're like rounded. Yeah, and a very nice soft boucle fabric, which gives it a softness. So I was very happy with that. And then we have two very cool tables, which are called the Tribeca tables, which are again designed for the space. Play with that idea of balance. They're two cantilevered tables in black silk marble, which almost looks almost looks like steel in a way, but it's, it doesn't have very many um, veins in it, but it's very beautiful. And then we complemented it with the travertine. And those tables are actually inspired by a building that I can see from my window in that room, which is the AT&T Long Lines oh. building. And it's a, um, it's a brutalist skyscraper that was uh, built in the seventies and it has no windows at all. Oh my um, God. It, the concrete structure it looks very ap apocalyptic in a way um, a lot of people you either love it or you hate it and I think it's brilliant because I love brutalist architecture right. um, but that kind of inspired the architecture around the tables and some of the details of the silhouette very interesting I mean personally I also like brutalist architecture but I wouldn't want to be spending quarantine in a windowless room <laughs> <laughs> well you know that that's some kind of office space or even there's a lot of conspiracy theories about that building as well <laughs> like as to what it actually sort of is so um yeah I don't think there's any residences in there but yeah I mean for sure especially in New York you need as much light and as many windows as you can as possible so speaking about light of course your lighting pieces are all around the apartment and the penthouse rather and is there apart from the lighting pieces are there any other similarities with your home in London where you are now and the New York penthouse? Well other than the room that I'm currently in in my London home the rest of the space is very very open plan. Um, I live in a converted fire station um, it has lots of industrial architectural details to the building um, so it's a very different space in, in that sense. And, you know, when you're working with an open plan environment, you want everything to kind of complement each other. So you have the, the dining space, the kitchen, the living space, all in one room. Whereas in the New York apartment, it was lots of separate individual rooms, which allowed me to create different vignettes. I mean, it's kind of got an overarching look to the apartment, but there are different colors, different textures. And that really appealed to me about that space. So I would say probably, no, it's not that similar, only in the fact that they're both quite modern spaces. But I would say that in the New York apartment, my study in there is very similar to my studio in London. Huh. Yeah, it has almost the same desk, uh, same chair, same light fixture. Um, and same kind of mixture of travertine and oak and different types of wood, rosewoods. And in there, there's a, a kind of uh, a record player, nice. which is like a furniture, uh, which I actually took from my London studio to New York, because I felt that if I was going to design successfully in that space in New York, I felt that it should kind of complement my studio in London because that space works very successfully for, for me. For recreating the inspirational inspirational environment and like um, where you're most productive, I suppose. Exactly. And studio is like home for me as well, you know, so it's kind of home from home in that respect. So I'd say that those were the two um, things that were very similar, but not not so much my London home. OK. And speaking of things you've brought into your New York home, um, you mentioned to the writer who, 
we spoke a few weeks ago that you brought a lot of vintage finds and art pieces into your New York home. Could you tell us about one piece in particular that you, 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 you love? Mm, definitely um, the bar in the dining room. It was uh, originally designed by Steve Chase, who is an American designer, and it's from a house in Laguna Beach, which he, he used to design houses and kind of make everything fixed. Everything was bespoke for the spaces. And he did a lot of celebrities' homes in the sort of late 70s, early 80s. Um, and a dealer in Los Angeles, um, who I work with often, said that he'd basically got a load of his fixed items from this house. And was I interested? And this item was actually a room divider. It wasn't a bar, but I felt that it would make a really great bar in, in the dining room, this space. And it's in perfect condition, a beautiful lacquered finish, very, very late seventies looking, very cool, um, but also very modern at the same time. So we, we bought that, we had it sent over from Los Angeles, but we had to have it hoisted on a crane from the <laughs> onto the roof of the penthouse we had the whole street closed off and called oh my god <laughs> and just to put this cocktail bar in you know I didn't you know it's a kind of typical interior designer's mistake of not kind of thinking that it might not go in the elevator <laughs> I think every interior designer has made that mistake but I kind of secretly knew that and I didn't care I just thought as long as I get it to New York, we'll find a way to get this bar into the into the building. Which I mean, that's how much you love it. It just exactly go the extra mile to get this bar in. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I can probably predict your answer to the next to the last question that I have for you today, which is the, what is the first thing you'll do once you get to New York, whenever that happens, hopefully this year. Well, depending on what time I get into the apartment, it'll be a martini. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> For sure, yeah. I have a beautiful cocktail set, my glasses, everything there ready for it. So, you know, I really look forward to kind of, you know, making a martini, stepping nice. out on the terrace, seeing the skyline and just kind of, you know, having that New York moment. And that's what you do as a, as a designer. You know, you're not just thinking of the, the decor and the aesthetics of the space, you're thinking about how it feels. And for me, you know, that particular room is about the view, the nighttime, the bar, and just creating those sort of New York moments and emphasizing them with the, the interior of the space. And being there 360, like 100% present in that space. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like I've almost been there. <laughs> completed already so it's going to be a surreal moment but um it'll be you know it's one that I'm really looking forward to great I'm looking forward to hearing that about that when you post it maybe on your Instagram or share with it with other people thank you so much Lee um, for those of you who want to see more of the home of course we've shared some pictures here um head on over to tatlersingapore.com or pick up a copy of Tatler Homes um, our April issue